Dr. Fitzgerald for inviting me to speak today, and I'm happy to be here and to speak with you as members of NORA. I have to admit I had never heard of NORA before being invited to speak at this meeting, and I do feel a little bit out of my element, so I wanted to preface my talk by saying that if you don't see what you're looking for, you've come to the right place, meaning that I'm going to try to make the information that I'm presenting relevant to you and what you do, but I may or may not succeed completely in doing that, but you are in the right room. Um, so I want to acknowledge the various participants with Parkinson disease, their family members and friends, as well as a number of volunteers who've made the work I'm going to tell you about possible, as well as the sources of funding that we've had to support this work. I should also note that not all of the work I'm going to talk about is work from our lab, but I've, been, I've tried to do a broader survey of the field to give you some more insight into what's going on. So this is what I'm going to do today uh, in the next 50 minutes, talk about Parkinson's disease briefly to kind of set the stage for those of you who may not be terribly familiar with the condition. Then we'll talk specifically about falls in Parkinson's disease. That'll lead us into a discussion of freezing, and then we'll put it all together in the end. So Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative condition that impacts the basal ganglia, the basal ganglia being the collection of deep nuclei that are shown here within the brain and they are connected in intricate ways to one another to form circuits that help us to regulate our movement among other functions. So this diagram shows the normal connections that you would see in an individual with a healthy nervous system. The red arrows show excitatory connections, the blue arrows are inhibitory connections, and that black arrow could be either excitatory or inhibitory, it's a modulatory connection. And normally all of these connections are balanced in such a way that we are able to select and produce the movement that we want to make, while at the same time making sure that competing movements that would interfere with what we want to do are suppressed. In the event of Parkinson's disease, we see degeneration of that modulatory pathway, that black arrow there, so I've shown it now as dashed, indicating that it's no longer functioning normally. These neurons that project through that pathway use dopamine as their neurotransmitter. So with the loss of dopamine, what we see resulting is an imbalance in the different aspects of this circuit. I've represented that imbalance by making the arrows thicker or thinner in this diagram. And the net result of all of this is that there's insufficient drive for movement. So when we see an individual with Parkinson's disease, we typically think of certain cardinal signs and symptoms that are actually used to give somebody the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And I've listed those here. So somebody who has a tremor when that body part is at rest and the tremor dissipates when they actually engage that body part in an activity. Someone who has slowness of movement or bradykinesia. Someone who has rigidity or an increased resistance to passive movement of a limb, the inability to completely turn off a muscle when trying to rest. And then postural instability or difficulty with balance. So these are the resulting hypokinetic symptoms that we see. So there's this paucity of movement relative to somebody who doesn't have Parkinson's. And typically it's asymmetric. So somebody will first notice symptoms on one side of the body. As the disease progresses, it will ultimately impact both sides of the body, but it tends to still be most severe on the side where it started. Now if somebody has three of these four cardinal signs, they could be given the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. But there are, these are not the only things that come along with Parkinson's. In fact, there are a whole host of symptoms and signs associated with the condition. And I say, if you've worked with one person who has Parkinson's, you've worked with one person who has Parkinson's. Everybody has a different collection of these symptoms and has different needs in terms of which ones they find most troublesome. But some of the other common things that we see are a flexed and forward posture a reduced movement of the face in addition to the rest of the body. So the face often is described as having a mask-like appearance. There's less emotional expression. Speech can also be impacted. So people with Parkinson's may tend to talk quickly and quietly and with a monotone quality. It can also impact handwriting. They might have very small handwriting. And of course, it can impact their walking as well. So in our lab, we've been particularly interested in these walking and balance issues because we know that they are major contributors to falls. And you can see here a vicious cycle with falls at the center, where because somebody has difficulty walking or difficulty with their balance, they may experience a fall. And once they fall, they may be injured as a result of that fall. And that injury can reduce their ability to participate in activities. Or even if they weren't injured, they might become fearful that they're going to fall again in the future. And that fear alone can result in a reduction in their level of activity and participation in everyday life. 
So whether they can't participate in things because they're afraid or because they've been injured, what we see is that they become less mobile and that can result in reductions in muscle and bone health as well as social isolation. And all of those things then result in a more malignant form of Parkinson's where the person experiences reduced quality of life and it's actually been associated with an increase in mortality associated with the disease. So because this is such a huge problem, we've been very interested in understanding falls, what contributes to them, and how we can address them among people with Parkinson's. So let's talk about falls in Parkinson's disease. They are very common. This figure shows the result of a fall. You can see on the left-hand side a stairwell that somebody has fallen down, and you may be able to see right there at the bottom this little dent. This is a close-up picture of that dent, and that's actually where the individual's head hit the wall after they went down the steps. So this is just to illustrate how serious this can be. These falls can be um, very injurious and even deadly. So this is a major problem and it's not just something that one or two people with Parkinson's experience once in a while. If we track a group of people with Parkinson's for a year, we find that seven out of 10 of those people will fall at least once within that one year period. And then if we look just at the people who experienced a fall, six out of 10 will experience more than one fall during that year. 20% of those people will fall more than 10 times. And it's not uncommon uh, in our practice for us to see people who fall up to 10 times a day. So these falls are incredibly common for people and actually become kind of part of their way of life. <laughs>